when Nikita Khrushchev, who ultimately succeeded Stalin, of course, delivered his so-called secret speech in February of 1956, a speech in which he characterized his illustrious predecessor as the ultimate sadist and egotist, I'm sure he had no idea of the, just the profound impact that it would have. And he meant for it to have a somewhat of a profound impact, of course, but man, this thing rippled throughout the world, Soviet world, non-Soviet world. I mean, by mid-year, it, it had been leaked to and it was published in the New York Times. Radio Free Europe, of course, CIA owned Radio Free Europe, is blaring it out over the airwaves in Iron Curtain countries. In Poland, the workers revolted. The Soviets had to bring in the big guns. Scores were killed, hundreds were imprisoned, and at the end of the day, the Soviets had to give in to a few of the Polish demands. Still, the opening of the Khrushchev era, buoyed up now by his famous anti-Stalinism, seemed to usher in a time of obviously still very limited but freer speech. People living behind the curtain seem to have felt a little more free to voice their opinions, to challenge you know, the local communist regime, to criticize this or that government policy, and even to challenge Russian hegemony. It's the big no-no, challenge Russian hegemony, at least to an extent. Here in Hungary, where the local regime had been characterized for years by its extreme brutality, these developments combined with, or were exacerbated by, you know, your typical communist shortages of fuel and food to create some serious unrest. And that unrest is gonna turn to armed rebellion, but it's not gonna happen right away. It's going to be sort of accidental. Well, a mostly student-led protest was organized for the afternoon of October 23rd. There were some workers there too, they combined their efforts, and they met in front of the statue of General Yusuf Bem, a hero to both the Poles and the Hungarians for his role, not just in the November uprising in Poland, failed November uprising, against Tsarist Russia, but also for his role in the 1848 revolution. So to both the Hungarians and the Poles, a hero as he fought against Tsarist Russia, so significant. And also significant in the sense that, you know, there are things happening in Poland, and here you have these protesters in Hungary in solidarity. So they're going to meet in front of the statue of Yusuf Bem. So very significant for a number of reasons. And here in front of this statue, these students are going to read their 16 points. These are essentially 16 demands. And these demands include things like, you know, the democratization of the party and of the local Hungarian regime, the expulsion or, you know, of all... Soviet Russian troops from Hungary, economic reforms, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, a justice meaning punishment for the old Hungarian officials and the government, the government criminals, a return of Hungarian tradition, all sorts of things, including as well a new government led by a man that the students picked, a man named Imre Nagy. Well, eventually the main protest moved across the Danube to the parliament building where their numbers swelled. They had something like 200,000 people by the end of the day there protesting. A second crowd gathered at the city's main park, not far from here, that way, uh, where they tore down a Stalin statue and then dramatically dragged the old dictator's head to the National Theater where they smashed it to pieces. A third crowd gathered at the main radio station. The idea here was to take it over and read the 16 points, read these demands on the air. Of course, when they got there, they weren't allowed to do so. They were arrested. Then a crowd grows outside of the station demanding the protesters release. Eventually, Hungarian soldiers are called in. Many of them join the protesters. It's very dramatic. At which point the police fire into the crowd. So blood has been spilled now. What had been a peaceful protest, if raucous protest, a peaceful protest, non-violent protest, has now been turned into an armed rebellion because some of the students who themselves are armed fire back. And at first, Moscow tried to appease the protesters, in particular by allowing Imre Noj to indeed become premier of Hungary. So who was Imre Noj? Well, this guy had been premier before. He had succeeded a uh, very brutal dictator. And so his reputation here was one of gentle rule and in addition, he was very popular here, uh, generally speaking, because he'd been willing at times to challenge Soviet leadership in Moscow. Of course, for this popularity and for his challenges, he's resented 
in Moscow, and these guys eventually remove him from power. I think he was officially labeled a revisionist. Love those communist terms, a revisionist. Well, now he's back by popular demand, and he immediately releases political prisoners and begins preparing the way for multi-party elections. Moscow allowed this and even withdrew its forces to just outside of Hungary's borders. The thinking being, well, in this way, as in Poland, we can pacify the people and we can demonstrate Moscow's munificence. But on October 31st, when Imre Noj announced essentially that Hungary officially would be neutral in the Cold War, uh, you know, withdrawing from the Warsaw Pact, that apparently was too much. A rival government was established in the eastern part of the country and Moscow ordered its forces back in. Of course, the rebels would love Western support, and the CIA is fueling those hopes through its radio broadcasts, which more or less promise some sort of major support is coming. Not to mention the CIA has hundreds of thousands of balloons floating over Iron Curtain countries, dropping anti-communist leaflets and books and aluminum freedom medals and whatnot. Meanwhile, you have Radio Free Europe, remember CIA owned, blaring out freedom or death, freedom or death, over the airwaves. That's pretty strong stuff. And Radio Free Europe is encouraging the rebels to attack Soviet tanks and instructing them on how best to do so, how to sabotage telephone lines, how to sabotage railroads. I mean, this is serious stuff. Radio Free Europe is even uh, uh, encouraging the belief that boots on the ground support is on the way. Armed help is coming. Well, the promised help never came, of course. You know, Britain and France may have been willing to intervene for the Suez Canal, but they were not willing to intervene for Hungary. The Royal Navy patrols Egypt's coastline while its carrier-based Venoms, Wyverns, and Seahawks carry out their task of destroying NASA's airfields. And Moscow took note. And as for the Americans, you know, they're in the midst of a presidential election. Not to mention the CIA never supported Imre Noj. In fact, it's Radio Free Asia is denouncing him as a traitor and a murderer. And they've got their own guy that they want to lead Hungary, not Imre Noj. So all this comes together, plus public chiding by Mao Zedong. He's chiding Nikita Khrushchev for not taking a harder line uh, you know, against the Hungarians. All this comes together by November 4th. You've got tanks and lots of tanks, Russian Soviet tanks, rolling through the streets of Budapest. 2,500 tanks sent by Moscow, plus 200,000 troops. Left completely on their own, tens of thousands of Hungarians were killed in these streets. The bodies of some of them dragged around by Soviet tanks as a warning to other would-be rebels. Now, in the last of a series of mass migrations from Hungary over the previous decade, something like 200,000 Hungarians left, fled west, to escape Moscow's fury. The last message of the Hungarian rebels via the Associated Press is heartrending. We are under heavy machine gun fire. Goodbye, friends. God save our souls. Now, it took about 10 days to restore order to Hungary. And in the aftermath, hundreds were executed by the government for their alleged roles in the uprising. Thousands more were carted away to prison camps in places like Siberia. Imre Noj himself was executed as a traitor. His body was thrown into an unmarked grave. And the years afterward, Hungary slowly but surely over the decades was able to act more and more autonomously, but of course it wasn't until the late 1980s and early 90s, the crumbling of the Soviet Union, that Hungary was truly able to wrest its independence back from Moscow. And it was about that same time, June 1989, that Imre Noj's body was exhumed and reburied, this time not as a traitor, but with full honors. Thousands attended the ceremony.